One of the first black teachers in Phoenix, a high school named after Betty Fairfax seals her legacy. Jean really did not like to be the person out front. And that's how Jean lived and worked. Worked so critical. Uh, not only is the only woman, but the only person of color in this photo. She knew it was important to document it. Jean was fearless. She was not intimidated by anyone. She felt like she, if she had something important to say, she was the right person at the right time to say it. Jean was born October 20th, 1920 in Cleveland, Ohio, just a couple months after the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote. Jean once stated, I don't separate myself from what happens to my people. That's the connectedness that I learned from my family, a family that also taught her the importance of education. Her mom and dad were the first in their family to be born into freedom, and the water department administrator and social worker were the first in their family to go to college. And Jean must have made her parents proud. Attending Cleveland Public Schools, Jean stood out. Jean kept her National Honor Society certificate from high school, Glenville High School in Cleveland, May 26, 1936. Then, right in the middle of World War II, Jean graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Michigan and three years later earned master's degrees in world religion at Union Theological Seminary and Columbia University, studying under world-renowned theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, who argued that Christianity is obligated to confront ethical, social, and moral problems. Jean's guiding principles. Jean was passionate about preserving and sustaining historically black colleges and universities. She was dean of women at Kentucky State College, now Kentucky State University, and been in the same capacity at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, now Tuskegee University. She was on the World Council of Churches and changed the racial composition of the governing board. She worked on civil rights programs at the YWCA and the Fellowship of Southern Churchmen. Now, this was dangerous, revolutionary work. It was an interdenominational, interracial group of Southern church people working on race relations and fighting anti-Semitism in the 1940s. Jean packed that passion and took it all the way to Austria following World War II, joining the Quaker group American Friends Service Committee in providing relief efforts, fixing roads and rooftops, and making friends. I have never seen anything like it. In a world that had just witnessed genocide, hate, she found peace, love, and acceptance. Everyone seemed to accept her and work together jointly, you know, for a common purpose. But not at home. Any mention of equal rights in the South was like a death sentence. And Jean marched towards it. Brothers and sisters, good morning. Here she is speaking at a national symposium at the University of Mississippi about her desegregation work as a community organizer. Ten years after Brown versus Board of Education declared racial segregation in the nation's public schools unconstitutional, Jean worked to integrate all white schools like Carthage Elementary. Waiting as federal marshals in Lee County assembled their rounds of ammunition and canisters of tear gas, I was aware that trouble 
Even violence was anticipated. In 1964, a federal court ordered the school to accept black students. The Ku Klux Klan had just murdered three civil rights workers, and the nine black families who wanted to enroll their children feared they were next. The fearless community organizer went from house to house in the middle of the night, trying to convince the families they would be protected, but they backed out. Then she came to the house of Deborah Lewis. I shall never forget the moment when six-year-old Deborah Lewis impatiently cried out, what's everybody waiting for? I'm ready to go. Deborah did well in school and graduated. Her legacy lives on in her niece, Maka Scott. The Phoenix Attorney is part of the Black Philanthropy Initiative. Now this is just how connected we all are. This is the same initiative Jean helped get off the ground. Groundbreaking policy had Jean's name all over it when she later joined the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Jean founded and served as the director of LDF's Division of Legal Information and Community Services from 1965 to 1984. During that time, she helped expose the widespread illegal diversion of federal funds that were supposed to help poor students. And in 1968, her study on injustices of school lunch and the publication Their Daily Bread prompted Congress to increase funding so that all students, like Nima, will have access to free and reduced lunch if they need it, no matter who they are or where they live. Yes, we can thank Jean for pushing for equity in school lunches and much more. When Jean and Betty came to Phoenix to retire, they didn't just rest and watch the sunset, no. Jean attended Harvard University as a Radcliffe visiting scholar. The sisters continued traveling around the world and they created endowments at the Arizona Community Foundation, where they are still able to give thousands of dollars a year to their causes. Jean didn't want that vision of equality and philanthropy to end with her. She helped develop the Black Philanthropy Initiative as another way for giving and connecting to our community. The BPI now has a family of funds, including a permanent endowment supported by African Americans and other like-minded donors to address relevant issues in the Black community. Philanthropy became Jean's new strategy of transforming and building communities. And she hoped it will become yours too. Because if you have clarity about your values like Jean, have empathy, willing to collaborate to problem solve, if you are undeterred, you will succeed in advancing the social good. That's what's most rewarding, because that kind of impact, the Gene Fairfax impact, lives on. What do you think? Awesome, huh? Uh, I would like Kim Covington to join us at the table. Kim, come on up. She put this piece together. Put your hands together for Kim Covington. Uh, many of you may have known Kim from, from her years of uh, uh, broadcast work at uh, KPNX TV. You know, she's done wonderful work. But she is now, the, the minute she retired uh, from, from television, the Arizona Community Foundation made it a point to go and recruit her and, and bring her on board. And she has a myriad of responsibilities, including uh, the BPI. Now, one thing that Jean used to say to me when we started the BPI is she said, I want black dollars. And uh, now, you know, uh, Harriet Tubman, who was on the 20, but would look better on the 100, you know, <laughs> represents black dollars, but all money is what color? Green. Green. 
right? And Kim has been responsible along with uh, uh, Gail Knight and also Robin Kulon in terms of generating those resources, not only for the BPI, but for other initiatives. Uh, what I want to do is have you talk about Jean, uh, Kim, and, uh, you know, after I make this comment, to give you some indication, these women came here from Cleveland, you know, Jean and Betty, and you've heard of uh, Fairfax High School. It's the only high school named after a line staff member, you know, in the Phoenix Union High School District. And a couple of, a couple of things that these women did, just to give you an example. They were not millionaires. When they came to Phoenix, they bought two houses in an area where the homes would appreciate. And they bought two houses because they knew one would appreciate and they could sell that home and add to their philanthropic initiatives. I think that's pretty phenomenal, don't you? So that gives you just a little bit of inkling, other than this phenomenal history about Jean Fairfax and, and her sister Betty in terms of how they wanted to serve our community. Uh, Kim, can you talk about uh, Jean Fairfax and your work at the Community Foundation? Hi, um, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, I had the pleasure of being the relationship manager of Jean's uh, funds at ECF and I could see thousands, tens of thousands of dollars going out the door to serve the disabled and um, those who are most marginalized. And because of their endowments, um, those funds continue to serve our community. Um, so over a million dollars going out the door uh, because they care so much about you. And that really inspired me. And so up until the time she got really sick, she was still working. Her brain never stopped, and Robin could attest to that. She was so strategic. So a dollar, you know, um, giving a dollar um, or $10,000 or $100,000 was strategized to the penny. So for example, one of the last projects we worked on was Hamilton. Now everybody wanted to go see Hamilton, right? Um, but she didn't care about us seeing Hamilton. She wanted the disabled. She wanted the kids uh, of color, um, those who could not afford a $200 ticket to go and see Hamilton. So even though um, she was very sick, she strategized about how she was going to get kids um, from the Phoenix Union High School District to see Hamilton. Now people probably think that's no big deal. You know, why she, why she focus on Hamilton? But arts and culture and history, civic engagement were critical. They were so important. And a lot of these kids did not have that opportunity. So she made it her purpose um, to, to get um, history classes. And she strategized about the kids who would most want to see Hamilton. So she made sure that certain history classes uh, at certain grade levels could see Hamilton and could get transportation to see Hamilton and could get fed after they saw Hamilton. So she thought, but she thought about all of that. Um, so that's just um, one example of the kind of woman Jean was. Um, she was always thinking about how to serve her, her, her community even when she was lying down on a pillow, um, very sick. She, you were on her mind, and that inspired me. And that's why the video is so important, because I don't want you to forget about this amazing woman. She will continue to live on, and Ben as well, because that is their legacy. And do you have a legacy? And that's what um, Gail and Robin and so many of us, and Michael, or so many of us, are, are trying to, uh, that message um, is so important, leave a lasting legacy. You don't have to be rich. You just have to love. You just have to care. I've got a tiny little fund at the Arizona Community Foundation, my husband and I, because we care. And we're not rich. We just want to leave a lasting legacy. The Black Philanthropy Initiative just wants to leave a lasting legacy and support our community seven generations from now, not just today, but to look into the future. 
The Arizona Community Foundation has about 1,900 funds, but most of those funds don't um, are, are, are established by people who don't look like us. <laughs> and so we want to make it our point to make sure that more people, um, whether they're disabled, a member of the LGBTQ community, Hispanic, Asian, African American, um, establish funds um, that can go directly to those causes you know impact your community. Um, and so I'm the Senior Director of Community Initiatives. My goal is to improve the outreach. I'm kind of like a reporter for the Arizona Community Foundation. I go out in the community, I assess the needs, and I work to support those needs. And that's not a lot different than what I did at 12 News. So it's been a, a pleasure. It is a pleasure to work for our community, this beautiful community, diverse community. And you tell me how you want the Arizona Community Foundation to work for you. That's part of my job. And Jean and Betty have inspired me, Robin and Gail have inspired me to work harder for you. Thank you. Well, you can tell she's not passionate at all <laughs> about Jean Fairfax and the work she does. But, um, Gail, can you talk about, you know, some of the, uh, the BPI, I know you're a part of that. Uh, can you talk about some of the grants that have been given to individuals, you know, from the current BPI fund? which has been the greatest inspiration of all. When we sat down to talk about and taking on this leadership role from Ms. Fairfax and Michael and Robin, about how do we continue to keep that going, the focus was on what are the needs of the community and setting up a way in which individuals, organizations could apply to dollars and making sure that we could meet those needs. We have given to STEAM organizations in the community that are working with children in communities that don't have access to computers, to instruction, to understanding the opportunities in the area of computer science and coding. We have given dollars to arts and culture, wonderful institution. The great thing about this too is what we discovered that is out there that we didn't know about before. And there's some wonderful organizations that are bringing arts and culture to young people in the community, giving them the opportunity to pursue their goal of wanting to play the violin, wanting to play a piano, wanting to sing opera. And we have been inviting them to our events so individuals will know about them and be able to also give to their organizations or support and volunteer for their organizations. We had at our last business meeting, the whole, was it the whole alpha group? <laughs> Pretty much. Almost Project all, alpha. yeah, Project <laughs> Alpha, oh my goodness. And then they were also celebrating their anniversary. And they worked with young men and mentoring and helping them to look forward to where they're going after high school, career development, looking at the positive things about life and bringing with them the understanding of being that young, upcoming leader in our, in our community. We even gave dollars to an organization that is working to increase the opportunities for individuals in the medical field to be more aware of what's going on in the community, to help them to make that leap from their instruction to their practice to being involved in the community. We have another group that is a group of mothers that are doing what my mother, grandmother, and all did, and that is lobbying and advocating for the needs of African-American kids, becoming more educated on how to lobby and advocate for their kids, being more focused on the laws that they are qualified for, that they never knew about before, in order to get school systems to give them those dollars for their kids' needs in the school. The type of organizations that we have been working with, education, early childhood education, STEAM, HIV, social justice has been absolutely inspiring. And each time we go through our grant period, we are more energized to raise more money because there's such a need out there, but there are also some great things going on as well. Thank you so much. Okay, we just have a few minutes left. 
And uh, just like Michael Jackson said to his nose, we won't keep you long. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Rose, Rose, uh, in the, we, we've got about five minutes left. So, Rose, can you talk about some of the needs, you know, of the disabled community? And then we'll come down this group and, excuse me, Robin, you've got the last word. Please. Can we just say that we're, uh, there's still, obviously, a, there's still a fight for people with disabilities to get, uh, Get with, uh, in a variety of areas. One is civil rights. Uh, we still see people with disabilities, and we also see the intersection of people with disabilities who are also uh, African American experiencing problems in terms of um, not getting accommodations in housing, being denied housing because of their disability. Um, and we know that housing is so key to many things like being able to maintain mental stability uh, if, um, and to have a, if you also have a disability. So we see it in housing. We see, uh, still see, we, we have benefited so much from uh, Ms. Fairfax's uh, donation that, with the Donaski case that created a system in place, but we still see children with disabilities um, and children with disabilities who are African American facing exclusion from school. Exclusion, it, it comes in, it doesn't just come in expulsions, it comes in multiple suspensions, it comes in shortened school days. Many children with autism be saying, we can't, the school saying, we can't deal with your behavior, but that's what they're there for. Um, and then excluding them and marginalizing them to one hour a day, two hours a day, and then sending them home for parents to deal with without getting that education or homebound services, placing children with disabilities that, are un, that they haven't been able to manage at home. So we still see exclusions and they take different ways and they put a therapeutic um, spin on it, but it's still children being excluded from the schools to be able to get their fair share of an education. And we're still working on those issues. It's still a lot to do. Employment, uh, discrimination, uh, and employers not willing to make uh, make the changes that they uh, need to make to make some modifications and accommodations to allow a workforce. We see a lot of discrimination for people who are uh, deaf and need sign language interpreters in work, in hospitals, in all all areas. So we see a tremendous amount of discrimination, but we also see that the tools that um, that the Donaski case through. Um, the Ms. Fairfax Benevolence gave us access to justice, a complaint system, because before we didn't have an adequate complaint system or monitoring system, and now we do, so we use that system. And I would just say one last thing. I think she would maybe smile upon this. I remember once we had um, a group of uh, parents in a community, and they all were facing the same thing. Their children had been denied specific therapies because their, the therapist had quit and they hadn't hired another one, and they hadn't told the family. One family found out that, um, that they had, that the therapist had put in their children, hadn't been getting therapy for months. And uh, they all went to an IHOP, and they all, first they called our office to get instructions about how to use this complaint system that came about because of the Donaski case. And then they all met at a restaurant, and together they filed a class complaint with the Department of Education to look into the issue. And so that tool that she gave still is empowering. That 88,000 children they thought would be benefiting from it, it's gone much farther than that, and it's still being used today in the house. Thank you. Karen and Robin, how has uh, Ms. Fairfax uh, impacted your life going forward? Just, and, and I apologize, it's, I know it's a heavy question, but if you could summarize that, it would be Moving helpful. Moving forward, her legacy will never uh, stop with the families I mentioned earlier. And the other phone call is Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, her legacy will never stop as far as I'm concerned with the families that she already served at Genesis City. And she, um, in fact, one of the, her, the people that, she, individuals that she took under her wing to help help was a young lady who was uh, struggling with deportation issues. She was fighting, um, being deported uh, by her, uh, her family was going to be deported. 
Uh, Ms. Fairfax uh, stepped up to the plate and provided her private money. This girl was actually really brilliant. We, she graduated from our program from high school, went on to the classical studies program with Jean's help. I ended up graduating with honors from the classical studies program. Then ended up going to transfer to ASU. She ended up graduating from law school. Six months before she graduated from law school, she had her own case with immigration. And now she's an immigration attorney. Now that, that young lady, just to show you the ripple effect of what has happened. That young lady, her name's Claudia Lopez, she um, has her own firm. Now she comes volunteers at Genesis to help those kids that are also struggling with the same issues at Reverse, and that's her specialty. So this is just one small example of what Ms. Fairfax and all her benevolent deeds and all her um, commitment to raising others up has done. Thank you, Karen. Robin. Jean decided at a very early age what kind of world she wanted to live in. And she went out there and she conquered. And she was one of the bravest people that I've ever known. If you think about her traveling throughout Europe and the South and going on to become the only woman in so many venues. So what I want you to take away is that, and I'm reminded of what Dr. Williams said this morning, just show up. Be consistently above average. Care about your community. Jean has poured the seeds in all of us to take action. From wherever you are sitting, from your point of view, from your venue, from your position in the community, you know, whatever you can do, whether it's vote, whether it's help somebody else who may need some help, whether it's to give your money, your time, give back. Because what she wanted was collaborative work, us working together. And she would be so inspired by this conference, Ronaldo's work, Kim Covington's work, the work of those in the community that really want to see us have equality and justice. But remember, most of all, keep the faith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, before we end on this part, uh, I, I was a, a student of religious, uh, African, African religion and philosophy. One, one of the proverbs in, in African folklore was, as long as you say somebody's name, they'll live on. So on the count of three, let's say Gene Fairfax. One, two, three. Gene Fairfax!